<laughs> Light up top. All right, so chatting up with third block, I realize that you guys have had some Civil War history before. You guys kind of have. Did anybody do a wax museum before? What? In third or fourth grade, some of y'all did a wax museum where you dressed up like a character and then people came up to you and you had to say a little line or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Third Block was telling me like Sanal dressed up like Harry Tubman and Anna Kate was uh, Jimmy Carter and Marley was Sacagawea, if I remember correctly. Point is, has anybody ever done that? No, I don't know. A couple of y'all maybe? Okay. So I think you got a background knowledge about some of these people. But we are going to go a little bit deeper in some of our conversation today. And, uh, of course, I'm going to try to keep it on topic. But if you have questions or something that relates uh, that you want to work out, you know, go ahead and ask, and I'll do the best I can to answer. So we'll talk about three big categories today, abolish, abolitionists, politicians, and then military generals. And then at the end, if you look at the back page of what you have stapled together, gives you a chance to pick one of these people to do some more reading. So whichever one sounds most interesting to you, maybe you want to do some more reading on them, come up with some more facts. That's what the whole back page is for. That's what we're trying to get today. So with no further ado, let's talk about some of the leading figures, people of the Civil War. First one, first category is abolitionists. Now, what is an abolitionist? A person, a person who opposes slavery. slavery. Someone who opposes slavery. I hope you know that. I hope you remember that. Or it's on the screen, of course. And then uh, abolition or abolitionism, right, you can change that word and make it into a verb, is the systematic opposition of slavery. Who is an abolitionist? What kind of person would be an abolitionist? Me. Oh, what kind of person? What kind of person? A slave. Okay. okay, slaves could be in favor of their own abolition. For White people? Sure. White people. White people. Northerners were generally for the abolition of slavery, yeah. But an abolitionist type of person was usually a Christian. Yeah, from a religious perspective. Now, so Christianity, obviously the dominant religion that we're talking about. And certainly that's not to say every Christian or every abolitionist was a Christian. And then, unfortunately, not every Christian was an abolitionist. There are some slave-owning Christians and that's a different conversation for a different day as to whether they were really following Christ. But uh, this, ab this abolition movement is rooted in religion. That's important to remember. The Second Great Awakening spreads these abolitionist ideas. So abolition is rooted in Christianity, rooted in religion. First one we're going to talk about is Frederick Douglass. Now I'll have a variety of words on the screen, and those are good to write down. I'll also be saying, you know, a lot of extras and... Just like if you're at church and your pastor's talking, you want to take notes, that's kind of what today's presentation is like. I know I've talked a lot for about three days in a row, but sometimes we have activities. Sometimes we got to lay the foundation. Once we, get in, once we get into a review week, we got to drill, drill, drill the vocab and certain test style questions, but it all comes together, okay? We don't have a dynamic activity every single day. Sometimes I actually got to, you know, I just got to teach like this from up front. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818. He uh, was born into slavery. So some black people in America were born free. Frederick Douglass was not one of them. He was born into slavery. He was born in the state of Maryland. So what do we know about Maryland? What kind of state was it? Southern. Oh, middle. Middle, middle. middle or border. border. Yeah, stayed in the Union, but still allowed slavery. So this is the Maryland that Frederick Douglass is born into. He was removed from his mother as an infant, lived with his maternal grandmother until he was age six. He was removed from her at age six. So by age six, he was moved away from all of his blood relatives. My kiddo, Sayla, comes in here for the block sometimes. She's five. I cannot imagine her being six and removed from all of her family. But this was Frederick Douglass's life. That kind of shows the, the horrors of slavery, the fact that he was removed from his family like that. We know a lot about Frederick Douglass because he, uh, uh, because he wrote a lot of books. Uh, and he wrote actually five autobiographies. So we know how he escaped from slavery from his own writing. And he escaped from slavery at age 20. He leaves Maryland, 
and he takes a series of trains and he runs over the ground and he sneaks his way into New York. And New York is a free state, so he is now free. Now, this is before the laws where slaves had to return to their owners. So when he arrived at the free state of New York, he was free at age 20. He goes on to uh, get an education. He learns to read and write. He's very well spoken. He writes five different autobiographies. So that's how we know a lot about his life and about his thinking from his own writing. Um, he's also an advocate for women's rights. So he was, of course, for African-American rights, but he also got in on the women's suffrage movement, the women's rights movement. So he was definitely an advocate for people who were down and out, people who were um, you know, not in the upper classes, but those who were fighting for their rights. He writes, uh, he writes a lot of powerful anti-slavery statements even before the Civil War. He's an abolitionist long before the country goes to war. And he actually has a very famous speech from 1852. And I bet you can tell what he's talking about just from the title of this speech. You ready for it? Yeah. Mark Juan, you ready for it? The title of the speech is, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July? What do you think he's going to say in this speech? That they don't get one. Nothing. Yeah. Celebrate independence, liberty, That's America, it's fireworks. That's what I'll celebrate. What to a slave is the 4th of July? Word. He writes this in 1852, right? As Americans are celebrating independence and freedom and liberty, he writes this essay, delivers this speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July? So it gets a lot of people thinking. Are we really a country that has freedom and justice for all, liberty and justice for all, or this institution of slavery? Like, that's exactly the opposite of freedom. How do we do this? How do we have uh, men, all men created equal, but we still have slavery? So Frederick Douglass was responsible for a lot of these thoughts uh, in our country. A couple of pictures here. He uh, Obviously, he ages. This might be the picture you're a little bit more familiar with and the picture that's on your page there. He's an older, distinguished gentleman. A couple of extra facts for you about him. He actually connects with John Brown. Hey, come on now. He connects with John Brown in 1858. So John Brown is the one who raids at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Frederick Douglass and John Brown, they knew each other, right? A lot of times celebrities these days, they DM each other or they tweet at each other, but they don't actually know each other. Well, these guys right here, they're leading figures in the abolition movement. They actually knew each other as well. So I think that's pretty cool that they connected and John Brown actually plans his raid at Harper's Ferry while he knew Frederick Douglass uh, in New York. So that's kind of interesting that they have crossed over in that regard as well. Frederick Douglass goes on to meet with Abraham Lincoln. He knows Abraham Lincoln. So that's another famous person that he crosses paths with, of course. Uh, and he actually advocated he to President Lincoln for colored soldier for you know colored people, black people to join the military. Yeah, you guys wrote that down. So the 54th Massachusetts that we talked about just yesterday, the fact that they were able to join the Union Army kind of comes from Frederick Douglass's legacy uh, as well. His first wife dies in 1882, and he remarries. Who do you think he remarries? Elizabeth. You're not, you're, you're gonna get, you know, yeah. That would be a good marriage, right? That'd be a good merger. That's not who. He actually marries a white woman who is a pretty, who's an activist. Now she's not she's not famous. Her name's Helen Pitts. Like that's not a name we recognize all that much. But the point is, at a time period when interracial marriage would have been pretty taboo, Frederick Douglass and Helen Pitts they get married. So they're kind of walking the walk, walking the talk, if you will, huh? Uh, I don't have a picture of her. Maybe I should find one sometime. What? One more little side fact, and then we'll get on to a couple of quotes, and we'll just be moving on from Frederick Douglass already. He is the first African-American to receive a vote for president. At the Republican convention in 1888, he received a vote from the state of Kentucky to be the Republican candidate for president. Now, he doesn't make it to the, uh, the round of actually running for president, but as a candidate, the Republicans were voting for their candidate, and he received one vote from the state of Kentucky. So that's pretty cool, right? 1888, after the war. But this black man, he's the first black man ever to receive a vote for president. So Frederick Douglass, the more you know, the more you know. Um, look at a couple quotes here, and let's, let's kind of see what he thinks about different aspects of life. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. What do you think he values with this quote here? Knowledge. 
Knowledge. How do you get knowledge? Absolutely. Reading books. Reading. Where do you read books? School library. Bible. Is he an advocate of education? Yes. yes. So you guys have to come to school. Well, I, I would argue you get to come to school. Right? You get to come to school. <laughs> Frederick Douglass and many, many people of his generation, of his time period, they didn't have a chance to come to school. They would have loved the opportunity that you guys have to come to school. I think it's but let me ask you this. How many of you grumble about coming to school? Or how many of you don't want to wake up and come to school? Oh, no, I'll wake up at let me challenge you then with this. What would Frederick Douglass think about that? He would think if you are not embracing your education, then you're wasting it. You're wasting your time. So I know I'm getting kind of a you know big idea here and speeching at you a little bit. Frederick Douglass would wish that you don't waste your education, don't waste your opportunity to go to school. Here's another quote from him. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Has anyone's coach ever said that to him? Yeah, you got to battle through the hard times to, uh, to get to the good times. Obviously, uh, African Americans were struggling. They were going through a big struggle, but he was telling his people, we're going to make progress from the struggle. Frederick Douglass is inspirational to future leaders as well, like Martin Luther King Jr. Obviously, MLK, he struggles as well to make progress. Question? Or for the back? All right. Okay, it might be done, but... Uh, no Einstein? such thing. What was Einstein doing? Oh, so what's he not born yet. Not alive yet. Fair question. It's not alive yet. Who else? Einstein. All right, so just, uh, this is Frederick Douglass. He, uh, he is... Uh, what, what do you think his greatest legacy is? He never shied away from the hard truths, right? He was willing to take on power. He was willing to talk to the president. He ran away from those who put him into slavery. So he never shied away from hard truths or from doing the right thing. That is Frederick Douglass. We're moving right along, okay? There was words on the screen. There was words on the screen. And then, of course, I said a lot of things as well. If you wrote that stuff down and I said something that maybe you wrote down, you're right on track. That's all I'm asking for you today, okay? Harriet Beecher Stowe. Is she kind of she kind of winking at you? She's nodding, stop, winking stop at you a little bit. There. Yeah, stop winking at me. Well, she first thing to note is that she's a she. She is a woman who is using her voice in this time period when women didn't really have a chance to stand on their own. So she's a brave, bold woman for doing that. Ansley, you got that? Brave, bold woman for using her voice. She authors a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin goes on to be a bestseller, almost an instant bestseller. These days we call it the New York Times bestsellers list. And uh, what, uh, what the book is about is it kind of peels back what is slavery. It follows, it follows a guy, follows a character named Uncle Tom or Tom. He's a house slave. But the story shows how ugly slavery is. You see, check this out. A lot of Southerners actually didn't want to uh, understand how bad slavery was. A lot of Southerners thought that they were just the people that worked in the field. They turned a blind eye to the idea that their families got split up, that slaves got whipped and beat, that slaves got sold. Right? They turned a blind eye to that. They didn't really recognize how ugly slavery was. Well, Uncle Tom's Cabin really peeled that back and started to show how ugly the institution of slavery is. Northerners, on the other hand, people who were for uh, abolition, they used this book as a you know propaganda or as a as a way to share how bad slavery was. So uh, the emotions captured in the book and the fact that it was a best <laughs> the fact that it was a bestseller it really started to uh, it, it really helped the abolitionist cause. Some people say it even brought the country to the brink of war. That Uncle Tom's Cabin was a big reason the country would ultimately go to civil war. Devin, what you got? Was uh, Frederick Douglass? Well, was he still alive during the uh, thing where runaway slaves could go to the north? Uh, yep, yep. This is a crossover, and well, he did not get returned. So, yeah, that's what I was yeah, yeah. I, I still don't. I don't have an answer on the question you asked me earlier this week. Well, yeah, that must be a situation where uh, you know he, since he had already previously escaped, he didn't have to be returned. What was the question I asked you earlier this week? You said if they escaped before that law, oh, did they, or maybe someone else asked me. No, it was you. It was you. Yeah. Did they have to be returned? Yeah, hey, crowd in the back there. That's it. Like yellow card. Next one. Someone's moving. Right. You speak I, soccer, right? I you, speak, I you speak soccer. Okay. All right. You got a yellow. Both. You got a yellow card right now. Next time someone's moving. Uh, Harry Beecher. So, so like I said, the uh, the book itself kind of ushered in the Civil War because it showed the division that was in the country. 
Harriet Beecher Stowe, she, uh, she goes on to meet Abraham Lincoln in 1862. This is a picture of Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is a picture of the book. Well, she meets Abraham Lincoln in 1862, so and what do you think Lincoln says to her when he says to her when um, he met her? You look good with a beard. <laughs> That's not what I'm going for. <laughs> this is what Lincoln says to Harry Beecher Stowe. He says, "So you're the little woman who wrote the book that caused this great war." How tall was she? Yeah, right. She's small but powerful. Her voice was powerful. Actually, leads me to a quote from her. I want to look at the quotes of some of these people because, you know, uh, how, how better to hear it than from their quotes. This is what she says. She says, I feel now that the time has come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. Women, what does she want you to do? Be loud. Rise up. Be not an aggravated. Use your voice. It's a really just oh, no. five of you yeah. in here. She wants to, She says that it doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter if you're in power or not. If you have something good to say, if you have something that is for the cause of freedom, then use your voice. Be she mad. was a woman at a time that was dominated by men. But she found her voice. She used her voice to make a difference. And her book really made a difference in the history of the country and the history of the world. So that is Harriet Beecher Stowe, an abolitionist and a woman, writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. All the time, all the time. All right, you ready? Ready to move on? Slade, I'm curious. Are you ready to move on? Yes. Okay, cool. Next is John Brown. See, man, the one yeah, crazy eye, John Brown. Now, of course, we've already talked about John Brown, but he is a leading abolitionist. And so I'm going to review real quick. What, what did we know about John Brown? What have we already talked about for John Brown? He fought against slavery. He fought against slavery. Where did he get his start? This is really random. Leading Kansas. Kansas is right, Slade. Well done. He used his family as an army, basically, and they took on pro-slavery settlers in Kansas. They actually raided their farms, and they killed five people in Kansas. Now, they leave Kansas without getting arrested or prosecuted, anything like that. They leave Kansas. They go to uh, they go east to Virginia. Actually, remember I said he met up with Frederick Douglass, and they actually knew each other a little bit? Well, in this time, he plans his next raid, and that raid is going to be in 1859 at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. What was at Harper's Ferry that he wanted? What building did he raid? The theater. Uh, not quite. Oh, no. The courthouse. So, not well, quite. This Two spent, two spent. Oh, that's Gettysburg. I'm glad you remember oh, that, though. So, well, he raids what? What you got, Brandon? Bank. Not a bank. He raids what's called an arsenal. What's in an arsenal? Weapons. Guns. Ah, guns and gunpowder. Because if you're going to build a slave army, you need weapons and ammo. We got questions? We good? Is Lincoln still alive now? Lincoln is still alive now. Yep, yep. Lincoln is still alive at uh, at all this point. This is pre-war. Okay, John Brown is doing this before the war. Before the war. What? Okay. So he raids this building that has weapons and ammo. When he's raiding the building, here comes the cavalry, the U.S. cavalry, and they surround the building. Do you remember who was leading the cavalry? John Brown. No, nope, the other one. Uh, Harry Tilly. No, it's that William, isn't it? No, nope, the other one. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, that's right. Yes. Robert E. Lee is leading the raid, uh, or leading the uh, the attack, uh, the people who surround John Brown. Well, remarkably, I think this is remarkable. Nobody in John Brown's army is killed or uh, is killed. They are all captured. When they are captured and they're captured alive, where do they go next? To jail. Yeah, to jail and to trial. So we've talked about how when he went on trial, his crime, what's that? Yeah, they, they hanged him. That's right. That's right. You guys are on track, and I'm just kind of reviewing along the way. His crime was called treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's like he offended the whole state of Virginia. And you guys are exactly right. He was sentenced to hang, and he was hanged on December 2nd, 1859. He was 59 years old. Just if you were curious, he was 59 years old. This is young John Brown. This is older John Brown. Now, we've talked about this picture right here that kind of makes him look crazy eyes. I think Jasmine said manic yesterday. He looks manic. And then we also talked about this portrait right here. 
This is a little different. Crazy John Brown versus kindly Grandpa John Brown. As a guy. And this is, that's right, held up as a saint. He died as a martyr. He was at uh, William Booth. John Wilkes Booth was at his execution. So good Where job. His blood. Good job. Yes. You guys are. You guys remember a whole lot of things. Portrait here, of course, shows him kissing a, 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 baby, a black baby on the forehead. Right. He's just showing his affections for uh, for the cause against slavery. And he actually says this is his final statement. He's about to be hanged. He's got the rope around his neck. He says this: I, John Brown. Am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but by blood. Was he right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So kind of a prophetic statement. This is still two years before the war would start. But he says what's going on is going to come to a, come to blows. Right? The only way that this land is going to heal itself is to wash away with blood. So he was right there, of course. Now he dies in 1859. He never goes on to see that slavery is abolished, but he was a contributor to it. Whether he knows it or not, in this lifetime, he contributed to slavery being abolished. This is all things related to John Brown. Our next abolitionist, our last one, is the famous Harriet Tubman. So before I say anything else, what do you already know about Harriet Tubman? She helped slaves escape. Help slaves escape. Oh, did she uh, did the underground? Let me hear on drive. Oh, let me hear Andrea. Help slaves escape on the what? Underground Railroad. Excellent. I said the wrong one. She got she said that I mean, Underground Railroad. So that's what you should remember. Yeah, yeah, that is the wrong one. Hey, I read a thing that it said that she has a tongue behind my pockets. Uh, yep, yep. The Underground Underground Railroad is very fascinating. There's a lot of details to it. Hey, if we're talking on topic, I get it, but if we're being too loud that other people can't hear me, that's not okay. Underground Railroad, there's a lot of specifics to it, and I'm not gonna, you know, I don't have time to like teach you all about the Underground Railroad. There's actually a great series about the Underground Railroad on Amazon Prime TV, uh, if you're curious about more. I'm gonna show you several pictures of Harriet Tubman. And you're going to see her go from a young lady, okay, this is when she was younger, and you're going to see her get older. And you're going to see her wear it on her face. You're going to see crinkles and wrinkles come on her face. And she just kind of, she wears her hard life, right? It was Life was clearly hard to her. She did a lot of hard things. She rescued people from slavery, but she wears it on her face. So just kind of take note of how she gets older across wow. these couple of years. How young do you think she was when she started? Yeah, that? What's that? How young do you think she was? Uh, she that's a good question. So she was born in 1820 in Maryland, just like Frederick Douglass, Maryland. That is the uh, uh, that is the uh, um, uh, border state. Border state. She escapes when she's 29 years old. So in 1849. So she was. Kind of already older when she actually escaped. She herself escaped on the Underground Railroad. How old was she? Uh, 29 years old when she escaped. Uh, and since she benefited from the Underground Railroad, the next thing she does in life is become a part of the Underground Railroad. And the, now when we say railroad, we're not talking about toot -toot trains. We're not talking about an actual railway. We're not talking about actual stations. It's all code language for the routes that slaves used to escape. A station would actually be a house. A conductor is someone like Harriet Tubman who led slaves to the to freedom. The railroad itself, it's not about you know like actual railroad ties. It is about the path that they would take to the north for freedom. So Harriet Tubman, she becomes a conductor on the railroad. But what that means is that she's leading other people to freedom. So it is said that she led up to 300 people to freedom. Pretty interesting thing here, and this kind of goes to show how history could, uh, you know, it kind of gets uh, convoluted. Harriet Tubman herself says she led about 70 people to freedom. But she might have been being humble, or she might have just underestimated, because historians have pieced together stories about people who say they were with Harriet Tubman and that she led them to freedom. And historians come up with the number as, as high as 300. So... How many people did she lead to freedom? We don't really exactly know. Between 70 up to 300, this is probably about how many people she led to freedom. And uh, she was a very good conductor. Okay, she was, uh, she was known for her success. She was known for never losing someone while she was taking them to freedom. She took old people. She took babies. You want to know kind of an interesting little fact? Well, sometimes she would have to give the babies sleep medication 
so that they would knock out oh, yes. so, they wouldn't cry. so they wouldn't cry. That's right. So she was very successful uh, with all the small Just little all the small little ticks and tr tricks and tips that she had to use to be successful. She was a very successful Wait, conductor. Right, question. How many people do you think she invited? Do I think, as a history reader, I think it's between 70 and 300. I think 400. Thanks for asking. Um, but think about it. Those, people, those are lives that she changed. Those are whole generations that she changed by leading them to freedom. I hope that in my life, I can make a difference to one person. And she made a difference to at least 70, up to 300 people, literally led them to freedom. You make a difference. So that's I mean, pretty you, cool. You talk to Thank your people. You, 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 talk, you talk to your Thank people. you. I appreciate y'all. No, it don't. Group, right? All right. So she does more people. than just be a conductor on the Underground Railroad. When the nurse or when the award kicks off, she had several jobs. Here's her jobs. She was a nurse and a spy and a guy Jesus. for the Union Army during the Civil War. What you got? I got to answer. Topic, but like, you think you could be president? I think anybody could be president. But Natural born mean, citizen. Me? The yes. answer is no. You want to know why? Why? Because I'm not 35 years old. No, I'm. Wait, what? No, I'm saying. To be president, you have to be 35 years old. And I'm once not. You're, like, Biden? Like, once you're 35, you think. <laughs> Would you like to run for president? I think I think I'd like to run for uh, city council first. Would you would you vote for me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, and that's all I need. You're 18 and you can vote. So that's all I okay. Yeah, well, I, I probably got a solid chance for city council then, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> They're all because you're all in Alma, so you can vote for city council. All right. So she has take take it back to Harry Tubman. She has multi talents. She was a nurse to soldiers who were wounded, right? She cared for them and helped their wounds and brought them water and all that kind of stuff. She was a nurse. She was a spy. Sometimes she could go to areas or she could hear information that the white soldiers couldn't. So she was a spy. And she, what's that? That's what she did. She did that. She acts like a slave. She acts like, that's right. That's great. She acts like a slave and that would let, you know, she could hear, overhear conversations. Or she could go on a plantation how or something like that. You're exactly right. If you had to say how she get away, she would have to escape. Like, she was a she was a master of disguise. She was all things, right? So she was a spy, right? There's a whole bunch of stories that come with being a spy. And then also she was a guy. She would lead the Union soldiers to the best creek or to the best trail. She would help them up, you know, plan their battles and such like that because as a guy. And that is notable because what is she? A uh, she. That's right. She's a woman. But these men would listen to her because of her expertise. So it goes to show you, we shouldn't see it as man or woman and better or not better, right? People are worth what they're worth. And she was a good guy. It didn't matter that she was a woman. People listened to her. So that's what that's what I'm going to give you on that one. Uh, when, when, I, when I decide. When I decide. Uh, a lot of people show this picture to show you that her nickname was actually Moses. Because just like in the Bible, Moses led people to freedom. He led the Israelites out of slavery. Harriet Tubman led people out of slavery. So my world historians, we talked about how religion affects everything. We looked at the world religions and how it affects everything. It goes to show you that so many of the things that happened in our country has a start with religion. Even like calling her Moses, that is that has a Bible reference to it. So kind of interesting that her nickname was Moses. Now she also knew John Brown. Okay, she crossed paths with John Brown as well. You know what he called her? Moses. He called her the general. Oh, yes, ma'am. Right. He said she is so authoritative. She is so strong. She's in command. She's the general. So that was a pretty honorable name for him to give her, a nickname for him to give her as well. I think someone said it, or maybe it was you. There's a movie called Harriet. This is the movie poster for it. Uh, you know, I think it's on Hulu or Amazon or something like that. Netflix. But what's that? It's on Netflix. I don't know if it's on Netflix. Uh, it's on one of the movie services, or you go get DVD or whatever. But there's this movie called Harriet. It's actually a relatively new movie, so it's you know it's, it's got good it's got good storytelling in it. Here's a quote actually from her. This is not from the movie, but this is from her. She says, "I never ran my train off the track. I never lost a passenger." So she's proud of the fact that she always helped her people get to safety. Nobody ever got caught. Nobody ever died while she was taking care of them. That's a pretty good track record right there. This is a mural on the side of a building. 
And this is in her hometown of Dorchester, Maryland. And what you can see here, it's very artistic, right? It's like she's reaching out through time and she's leading people to freedom. It's like, hey, take my hand and I'll bring you to freedom. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful picture right there. Uh, a lot of people like to come and take their, you know, pose with this. It's like they're reaching back, reaching back to her, like she's going to help them to freedom. Pretty cool. This is her in old age. Do you see how the years wore on her? Oh, she died of old age. Right? Uh, yeah. She, so she lived all the way till 1913. Oh, she sure. was uh, 83 years old. 1820 to 93 years old. 93 years old. She, she, she lived a full life. And uh, that's Grandma Moses right there. Right? That's Grandma Moses right there. What is our country currently doing to honor Harriet Tubman? We don't be a big That's right. So I actually did a little reading since we talked about this the first time. This bill is supposed to roll out in the year 2023. So uh, I don't know if it's still on track or not, but it's supposed to roll out in 2023. They change the photo to a younger Harriet. Yeah, well, I don't know if they really decided on the photo. I don't think anybody will really know until we see it. But uh, that's just an example. Money is still money until they take it off. Like basically, the government takes money out of circulation, destroys it. So your your twenty dollar bills will still be worth twenty dollars. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to make this agreement with me. Whatever year this comes out, whether it's 2023 or later, when you get a Harriet Tubman twenty dollar bill to put in your pocket. I want you to think of this class. I want you to think about this class. Maybe even send me a picture or an email or something like that. I'll give it to you. When you or give it to me. No, 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 no. Don't give it to me. Don't give it to me. Keep it. Keep your $20 bill. But when you get a Harry Tubman $20 bill, I want you to remember this class. Can you do that for me? Cool. Good talk. Come out here, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. All right, we will pause there. We've talked about four big people. Take our bathroom break. When we come back, we're going to talk about politics. Let me take some. Everybody loves politics. I surprised myself today. Well, you should not, Frank. I must be. I must be being interesting. Left, left, left. Four walk. Four walk. Four walk. You won't look, guys.
Oh, it's back there. Uh, all right, we're doing good, except that we're still missing half the class. We walked our way through the abolitionists. Take a seat, take a seat. That's the main boy. He's pretty funny. Yeah, I can do it better. Talon's at the office. Terrius. All right, I'm going to push on for time. We are talking now about political leaders. And you see on your page, there's the big two. Let's start with Abraham Lincoln. Now, obviously, we could talk on and on and on and on and on about Abraham Lincoln. There is so much information to go over for Abraham Lincoln. My, my hardest part, the hardest part of my job is to summarize the small stuff. I got to summarize the small, you know, I got to summarize Abraham Lincoln for you. So here's the summary. First of all, he's elected in 1860. Excuse me. You gotta always connect that with Abraham Lincoln. The election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln divided the country. The southern states thought Lincoln was just ready to do away with their whole style, their whole lifestyle, states' rights, uh, slavery, etc. So many of the southern states uh, withdrew, seceded, even before he swore in as president. We've been over this. He is the 16th president of the United States. Now, hear me on this. A lot of history classes. Uh, have their students memorize all the presidents, all 46 presidents. I, th I think that's a great thing to do, but in my class, that's not going to be something that's a great. However, we do got to we got to know the big ones, right? George Washington, number one, that's easy. Well, Abraham Lincoln is 16. You know, you should probably know, you should probably make it a memorized fact that Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president of the United States. Sayla knows. Ask Sayla next time she comes in. She'll tell you Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president of the United States. Oh, wow. She's coming today. And then she's not coming today. And then, of course, the big attitude from Abraham Lincoln is he wanted to preserve the union, right? He, he thought we were not a collection of states with individual identities, but we are a union. We are one nation coming together. So that's those are some pretty simple Abraham Lincoln facts. We've been over that. There are a couple more things that are in our Georgia standards that I want to teach you specifically about Abraham Lincoln. So I'm going to use this chunk of time to teach you those specifics. What? All right, so you know how you say you got to be popular to run for president. Sure. How did he become popular? Uh, because he had been a congressman, and he uh, had been a politician his whole life. That's a good question. He'd been a congressman. He had name recognition. He'd been campaigning for votes his whole life. Uh, you know, he's giving speeches and meeting people one town at a time. That's how he became popular. Popularity is a little bit different back then. These days, you can email or tweet or go so viral. That. What's that? Can you do that? You so can I can do that? You guys really want me to run for president, don't you? I got to turn 35 first, for starters. I appreciate oh, that. I thought you, you said you had to be 35. I'm like, you not that young? I am not yet 35, therefore I cannot run for president. Like 20, so. But I will be in 2024. So I guess this is Tyler, Mr. Tyler, this is my election. This is my side. You ain't got 20. You're not yet 20. That's the next presidential election. You will vote for you. You will use 34. All right, someone make me a poster that I can get printed off. We'll, we'll go from there. We'll go from there. All right, so a uh, bit of a review, I hope. Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm going to go over each of these again. Delivers the Gettysburg Address. We know that he calls for unity in the Gettysburg Address. And then his second, and, all right, fellas, got it. My, we're not debating my age anymore. Second inaugural address also has a theme of unity. So I'm going to go over each of these. Emancipation should be a review. Gettysburg and the second inaugural address, they have themes of unity. And then also on your page, you see the writ of habeas corpus. Just hang on to that because I'm going to get to that guy as well. So I see some pencils still moving, but not that many. So uh, somebody tell me, what? when did the Emancipation Proclamation get issued? After what battle? Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Civil War. The Emancipation. A. And... T. Antietam. Brandon, that's good. Antietam. I know it's a tough word. Following the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln uses the momentum from that victory to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Who was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation? Slaves. Where? The, set, the north. No. South. Yes. And not where? Border. Excellent. Right? 
We freed slaves in the deep south, but not in the border states. Freed slaves in the rebelling states, but not in the border states. So this is review, right? It was largely sentimental. It was nice to hear that the slaves had been freed, but if the Union Army wasn't in the heart of Alabama, it's not like people in Alabama were going to follow this proclamation. However, the hope was that slaves would hear of this. Hey, Mr. Lincoln has freed us. And when the slaves heard this, that they would try to run to the north. In doing so, that is taking the, uh, a major piece of the southern economy uh, to the north. So the slaves are important to the, the southern economy. If they run away to the north, that cripples the southern economy. So there's a lot going on with the Emancipation Proclamation. Hopefully that was a review. Yes, sir. Right, so they're like president freed the slaves. So like the owner of the slave is like, oh, you, you free to go or like they try to run away. Well, that's what I'm saying. In let's say the middle of Alabama, and there are no Union Army soldiers around. They were not going to say, oh, President Lincoln, who I don't even think is my president, said that you're free, so you're free. They weren't going to follow that. But if the Union Army moves into Alabama and kind of owns this territory, they would go farm to farm and free those slaves that were around. So, uh, yeah, if they tried to run away, the Southerners, they were still going to enforce uh, punishment. They were going to whip them or shoot them, just like you said. So that's what I mean by it didn't have, it was largely sentimental. It didn't really hold the law with it because the southern states weren't necessarily going to follow it. Uh, gets, gets us so that, again, that was a lot of review, Emancipation Proclamation, I hope, gets us to, uh, gets us to this habeas corpus. And you see that on your page here. Something, uh, something Lincoln did was greatly expand presidential power. He flexed on the country. He actually flexed on the Constitution in a big way because he ignored certain pieces of the Constitution related to, uh, related to justice and related to the right to a fair and speedy trial. And what he did was suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And I know that that's a funny word that you probably don't understand, so I'm going to explain it to you. Now, you see the judge's gavel there. That is because it's related to the justice system. And I'm going to explain it in just a second. As soon as y'all are kind of caught up on your writing, it looks like you're there. <clears throat> All right, here's what habeas corpus is. Aww. It means, it literally means, it's a Latin phrase that means show me the body. It is a part of our justice system that says you have to be charged with a crime, you have to appear before a judge, and you have to be given the reason for why you're in jail. What it means is that you cannot be taken off the streets, put in jail, and never given a court date. If I just snatched you off the street, Slade, I didn't tell you what your crime was, I put you in the county jail, and you never had a chance to go before the judge, does that feel fair? Yeah, it's not fair, and that's not what America is founded on. Well, during the war, Lincoln did this to his enemies. He snatched them up, put them in jail, and he never gave them a court date. He said that as a wartime president, it was his power to suspend this right to tell people what they're being charged with and to give them a court date. What type of person do you think he was putting into jail under this cause? So people that didn't like him. Owners. People that didn't like him, slave owners, people that disagreed with the Union, especially in the North. You know, if there were secessionists in the North, boom, you go into jail. Now, a lot of people think that this was too much power for the president. A lot of people think that this was Lincoln acting like a tyrant or acting like a bad guy. I know a lot of times we hold Lincoln up as a saint, a savior. He was the best president we had. He was the good guy who freed the slaves. But he also had to make some tough decisions. He had to control his enemies, right? If you're going to be in power, you can't have your enemies nipping at your heels. So he did the way he did this was by suspending this right to a trial. And it's called habeas corpus. Think about the word corpse, it means body. That's where you get the phrase, show me the body. So, so, uh, so habeas corpus means I have to sh put the body in a courtroom. Show me the body, put the criminal in the courtroom, and give him a trial date. Suspending the right, though, suspending the writ, that's what Lincoln did. And Lincoln suspended this right during the Civil War. He frequently imprisoned his enemies without charges and without a trial date. So my third block, they were really... They were kind of disturbed by this. They're like, wait a second. Lincoln was putting people in jail for no reason. 
Lincoln was putting the people in jail without cause. It's kind of it's kind of an affront to what we think about Abraham Lincoln and what we you know he's the good guy he's the, the freer of the slaves but he also had a you know he had a tough streak to him and suspending the writ of habeas corpus was one of those things so do you understand habeas corpus maybe a little bit better than you did before yes some of y'all still writing this down I'll give you a second I actually wrote one give myself a second. All right, so we reviewed emancipation. This was, we went over habeas. To bring that in. Yes, please. Something they've heard and seen is on movies where someone, they take them to jail and they're like, either charge me or let me go. But habeas so, corpus. Yep. I like the word corpus and corpse, right? To me, that's really easy to remember. Show me the body. Put the body in the courtroom. Corpus. All right, I'm going to move on. We reviewed emancipation. We have talked habeas corpus, kind of a new term to you, and that is one. That is one. Now I, I, you've seen it on Book It, right? Maybe that's one where you're like, "Man, I got no idea what that means." But now that I've explained it to you, hopefully you understand a whole lot better. And then now we need to talk about the second inaugural address, and it was a theme of unity. Gettysburg Address should go in here as well. Lincoln's second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address—they both have a theme of unity. Gettysburg Address, he's, you know, these are opportunities where he could have, like, danced on top of the South. Hey, we're better than you. You suck. We're good. We're winning. But he didn't do that. He didn't embarrass them. He didn't shame them. All he did was call for unity. It's time for the country to come back together and heal. So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you one of the phrases from his second inaugural address right here in a second. You got pencils moving. Then we can go to the bathroom. Oh, wait, we were doing this guy. So here's a phrase from his second novel address. He says, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, and the work we are in is to mend the nation's wounds. That's all we're trying to do, everybody. North, south, man, woman, we just want to mend the nation's wounds. So what is that? Let's take that first phrase. What does malice mean? Oh, malicious intent, anger. You go with anger with anger towards no one. What and then what is charity? Park Wan, what is charity? Mm, raise money for someone. Raising money or like giving, giving kindness. So with anger towards no one, with kindness for all, let us strive to finish the work we are in to heal the nation. So that is what his statement is. He wants to bring everybody back together. He's not trying to punish the South. He's not trying to put everybody in jail. He wants to uh, he wants to bring us back together. Uh, this is actually a picture of Lincoln's second inaugural address. And you can see it's a black and white photo. It looks really, really busy. Look how close people are to the president. Can you see which one's the president? Oh, good question. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, I saw Andrea just like led right into my picture. You're the black white. So that's Lincoln right there. You can tell that he's standing up. You know, now that I pointed it out, you probably see he's at a podium a little bit better. But yeah, that, that's, look how close people are to him. He's a like, shot. What if somebody had a knife? What if somebody had a gun and wanted to hurt him? Very, very different than today, right? Today, there's so much security and people, people go through metal detectors, all that kind of stuff. Well, you can't exactly see it in the photo. But right about here, if I remember my reading correctly, right about here, do you know who's about 25 feet away from the president? John, John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth is right. John Wilkes Booth was at this speech. He said in his own writings, he says he was close enough to shoot the president if he wanted to. Now, the reason he didn't shoot the president at this time is because he never would have escaped and he wanted to escape. But he was so angry at Lincoln at this speech, right, especially kind of he felt that he was talking down to the South, which he really wasn't. He was talking about unity. But John Wilkes Booth was about 25 feet away from the president. He did not kill him at this time, but one month later, one month later, he does kill him. And I'm going to save some of the details of this story for next week, because I'm going to tell you the whole story. It's very interesting. I'm going to try to bring it alive for you. But here's just a little bit about John Wilkes Booth, who shot the president. He did it at the theater. You can see that the president, he's in the presidential box. They're watching the play. 
John Wilkes Booth sneaks in and just shoots him right in the head. What you got? Well, we went to DC. That they actually still have all that chair, like the chairs and all. And the blue oh, screen. it's excellent. Like, you got pictures? My mom oh, does. Sit, email me some pictures. I would love to see your pictures from that trip. And his gun is like framed up there too. Slade's exactly right. So you can visit the spot where Lincoln was shot. Uh, and I am going to tell you all about that next week. It's called Ford's Theater, and you recently went on a trip, and you got to see that. That is very cool. If you got pictures, I'd love to see them. I'd love you to send them to me. I, I, I might let you teach the class. Can you teach the class a little bit? A little bit? Yeah. Devin, what's your hand? Do you think that if he didn't get killed, if Lincoln didn't get killed? I think that's a very interesting question. Like, what about history would be different yeah. if Lincoln didn't get killed? It's like, I feel like, it really, I don't know. Maybe everything, right? Maybe everything. What about any small detail in history being different? Maybe everything would be different because of that. Anyway, so John Wilkes Booth, he shoots the president, What? and he's kind of up high. They're in the second story. After that, he jumps from the stage. He actually breaks his ankle, and he hobbles out of the theater. He hobbles out of the field. He went so, up under like a bank. That that he, is, went uh, under the he, what, he went, went up under the stage. That's right. That's right. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to save a couple of the details for next week. And it sounds like Slade knows a lot about it because he just visited there. That's awesome. Uh, so, I hope you'll awesome, hope you'll come to school next week because we're going to kind of live out live out the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, this is uh, this is one of my favorite pictures because it's a little bit more modern. Uh, the colors are kind of popping on it, and you can see Booth like jumping out, and Lincoln just got shot. And, you know, she's like gasping like that. So just kind of a really powerful picture to think about being there. And like the street, of, like across from the theater, they actually have the bed where they still come to treat them. Right. So hey, hey, come back to me. For, for Terry. Like, you talk about it? Okay. So Slade says that Lincoln was carried across the street uh, to a boarding house, basically like a hotel room, and they laid him in a bed. They didn't get him to a hospital, right? There was no hospital to get him to. Um, and he dies in that bed just right across the street about one day later. So very cool that you've seen that, Slade. I, I love that. And that kind of connects to our class a lot as well. Here is a. Is that the second time I've done that? I'll get that later. Good job. Mr. All right, go to the bathroom. I'm just kidding. Go to the bathroom? No. All right, there's a movie called Lincoln. It is actually a very, very good movie. The actor in this movie, his name's Daniel Day Lewis, and he is, he's called, he, he does what's called method acting, and that means he lives out his role the entire time that they're filming. So, like, he didn't go home and talk to his wife like Daniel. He stayed like Abraham Lincoln the whole time they were filming. He stayed in character the whole time they were filming. So that makes it a really good movie. It's very accurate and his mannerisms and his face and his voice, all that kind of stuff is just like spot on for Lincoln. So good really good movie. I think it's on Hulu right now. There's a uh, show about him where he's a, a witch hunter. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Vampire Hunter actually. Yeah. Vampire. Uh, and it's based off this book called uh, Team of Rivals, and what does that sound a whole lot like? Who else built a team of rivals? Washington. Washington. And what were they called? The Cup. Cap. Cap. Yeah, that's right. So sometimes you don't have to get all your friends on the same team. Sometimes you want to have people who disagree a little bit because they might actually give you better advice. So this kind of rounds out Lincoln. We'll talk more about him next week as well. Moving on to the president of the Confederacy, this is Jefferson Davis. Huh? What the hell was Lincoln? You thought Lincoln was what? Oh, you thought? Oh, we did point out earlier this week that they kind of look similar. It's okay. The it's the beard for me too. Jefferson Davis. Now he was a senator from Mississippi, so that shows that he was actually serving his country. He was serving the United States, but he was also a very, very deep South slave-owning, <laughs> states' rights kind of guy. And when Mississippi seceded from the Union, he also, uh, you know, he, he left uh, immediately as well because people tended to follow what their states were doing. And he gets elected as president of the Confederacy in 1861. He is the first and only president of the Confederacy. They never have a second one. The whole thing dissolves before they ever have a second president. Uh, even though he was elected, he actually didn't have a lot of support from state governors. 
He has rivals, people that didn't like him. So he was elected president, but at the same time, he also had struggles getting everybody on the same page. Kind of interesting because when your whole thing about your country is states' rights and states get to make their own choices, kind of hard to get them on the same page at the federal level, which he quickly found out. So he was elected, but he also had problems. He had feuds. Uh, he had enemies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm going to start to show you, as we talk about these next five figures, I'm going to start to show you where they went to college, and you are going to see a common theme in all of them. I see that you guys are writing still, so I'll give it a second before I move on. No writer. Need a writer? Okay, good throw. Boom goes the dynamo. Good throw. I got hit. <laughs> So Jefferson Davis, like a lot of these guys, he got his start in the military uh, before he became a politician. He fought in the Mexican War, which most of these generals were about to talk about. They got their experience in the Mexican Wait, War as well. What's it? Yeah. Who was the first Mexican coming? Huh? Who was the first Mexican that came to America? Uh, Santa Ana. Juan Padre Santa Ana. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have that answer. <laughs> Google it. Google it. Uh, Jefferson Davis goes to college at West Point, which is exactly where I went to college. Yeah. So the history of the military academy, there's a lot of Civil War history, and a lot of people, it's in New York, yep. Yeah. He's West Point class of 1828, and a very interesting little side fact, as a young cadet, he was involved in something called the 1826 Eggnog Riot, where at Christmas time, these cadets smuggled into the academy whiskey. Ooh, whiskey, yeah. And this whiskey, they poured it into the eggnog for the Christmas dinner. So when you got a bunch of young people drinking eggnog that's been spiked with whiskey, what do you think's gonna happen? They're gonna get drunk. Ooh, they got crazy, yeah. So it's called the eggnog riot. And because of this, because he was at the middle of it, he actually got put on room uh, restriction, uh, basically like house arrest. Uh, so that's just a little side fact about when uh, Jefferson Davis was uh, was an Army cadet. This is Jefferson Davis during the Mexican War. Like I said, a lot of them got their start in the military, and, they, and he's one of them. He uh, So let me tell you how it all ends for Jefferson Davis. Want to hear this story? Yeah. So as, as Grant is coming up on General Lee's Army, as it is appearing that General Lee is going to have to surrender, Jefferson Davis did not want to believe that the end was near. He wanted to believe that the Confederacy could still fight on. So what he does, he takes his family, he takes his close leaders, his cabinet, they leave Richmond, Virginia, and their goal is to make it all the way to Texas. Texas is kind of the western edge of the Confederacy. So if they could go from Virginia to Texas, he believes they could keep fighting a guerrilla war and they could stay in the they could keep the war going for a long time and maybe the Union would get tired of the war, maybe they still had a chance. Now, General Lee disagrees with this, right? Obviously, he surrenders his army and the, and the war, war is over. But as Jefferson Davis leaves Virginia, listen to this, just let him be. As Jefferson Davis leaves Virginia, he makes his way to Georgia, right? So he's right where we are. In Irwinville, Georgia, which is 55 miles west of where we sit right now, okay? Jefferson Davis was captured in Irwinville, Georgia on May 10th, 1865. And he was wearing a woman's dress. As this guy's. He was trying to escape while wearing a dress, and but it didn't help because he was still rounded up by these Union soldiers. Now, realistically, realistically, he was probably just wearing a large overcoat, uh, not exactly like a petticoat and a dress and stockings and high heels. But if you're the Union. And you what you just defeated the Confederacy. How do you want to make Jefferson Davis look? Oh bad. Well, yeah, you want to make him look bad. So what you say is that he was wearing a lady's dress and he had stockings on and he was wearing high heels and he was trying to run away and escape. So was he in a dress or was it just an overcoat? You know, we may never really know for sure. Dress. But the story is Jefferson Davis was found hiding in a dress, disguised like a woman when he was captured by the Union Army. So this got used as propaganda. This definitely got used as propaganda to try to make him look weak and effeminate, try to make the Confederacy look, look like wimps, uh, who has a president who dresses in woman's clothing. So it's very interesting that this all happens just 55 miles away from here. 
there is a marker in Irwinville where he got captured, but it's really not all that much to write home about. You know, I always tell you guys to go to the good museums and such. This is really just kind of a pretty tiny marker that says Jefferson, Dav Jefferson Davis got captured right here. Uh, and then I did kind of already make this point last week or earlier this week, Hazelhurst, Georgia, which is Jeff Davis County. It is the same Jefferson Davis. It is named after the president of the Confederacy. And it blows my mind that this state still has a county named after the president of the Confederacy and all that the Confederacy means, right? Slaves and racism. But here we have Hazelhurst, Georgia, named, named after Jeff Davis. So, like I said, maybe your generation will fix that. Or, Angel, if you vote for me for president, maybe I'll have a chance to fix that. What are you going to change it to? Who knows? What are we going to change it to? Yeah. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant County. Swanson Abraham Lincoln County. Lincoln County. There's a lot of Lincoln County. So I changed out with Georgia. All right, moving on to these four generals. And I'm going to go a little bit fast just so we can get going. First one, leader of the Union Swanson. Army, Swanson. Ulysses S. Grant. His name is Ulysses S. Grant, so his initials are U.S., and his nickname was actually Unconditional Surrender Grant. He was so aggressive and so ruthless to his uh, enemies, he never offered them anything other than Unconditional <laughs> Surrender. So he is known as Unconditional Surrender Grant. He was that aggressive commander that Lincoln always wanted. Several other Union commanders were too timid or too shy to uh, follow the retreating Confederates to uh, kill them and end the war. But not Grant. Grant was aggressive. Grant was the one who could get it done. He was uh, born in Ohio. Okay, so he's from Ohio. What? He went, Where do you think he went to school? West Point. West Point is true. He was West Point class in 1843. He also fought in the Mexican-American War, like many of these generals who got their experience uh, before the Civil War. Um, and after the war, do you know what he went on to do? Men and resources. I don't know. Oh, president. Uh, uh, yeah, he's the 18th president of the United States. So he fights on behalf of freeing the slaves. And then as president, one of his big things was making sure that these newly freed African-Americans were, were cared for because there's still a lot of racism in the country. There's still a lot of things going on that were trying to keep black people put down. There's a terrorist group called the KKK. Oh, that's president that. Grant, President Ulysses S. Grant, his mission as president was to try to make sure that black people were cared for. They had jobs, they had land, all that kind of stuff. Work. Why do you look at that to me, Slee? Any president, like, any president, like, if they wanted to make it, like, uh, like, make slavery a thing again? Make it legal again? Yeah, like, if they wanted to do it. No. no. So, answer is no, because the president can't do anything by himself. He has to go through Congress. Congress would never, 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 never vote slavery back into existence. Oh, so, what, if, what if they do? Yeah, I can't get into the what is, man. If they do, I'll buy all y'all the same time free. If they do, uh, then Lord it. come quickly, <laughs> right? Lord come quickly is what I would say. Yeah. Ulysses S. Grant, yeah. West Point graduate, class of 1843. So again, you have the same heritage. These guys all come out of the military academy, the West Point Military Academy. Same school that I went to, right? So I've studied these guys a lot. I've walked in their footsteps. They are far greater than I, uh, but I'm proud to be from the same institution, the same school. Just a couple pictures of Grant. He's a pretty good looking guy. It's the hey, of me, right? This Are guy, that, that's, whoo, though, that's a strong looking fella right there. And did you know if you have $50 in your pocket, you are carrying a great $50 bill. That's Grant right there. $50 bill. <laughs> he looks a little plump there, doesn't he? Yeah, that's what he was president. He put on a few pounds, I guess. So $50 bill is a grant. Uh, at the end of his life, he actually uh, he went bankrupt. Uh, he got bought, he got involved in some bad investments. He went bankrupt, and he dies of cancer at age 67, so relatively young. And to support his family, right before he dies, he writes his memoirs. He writes his autobiography. What? You said 87. 67. He dies at age 67. So I mean, relatively young. He could have lived longer if he hadn't been such a. You know what he died from? Tobacco, right? And mostly chewing tobacco. He had throat cancer. Yeah, he told That's how he died. Yeah. Well, this is a picture of, this is the last picture taken of him. And you can see he looks pretty sickly. 
He's uh he's like wrapped in he's wrapped in a jacket because his body is giving out. He's cold. But what he's doing is writing his memoirs, his book. And after he dies, his book becomes a bestseller and it makes money for his family. So he supports his family even after he died. Devin, what's your question? How did the president get their face on? Uh, I'll, I'll get that later. I'll get that later. History Channel has a pretty good three-part mini-series called Grant, and uh, I just continue to show you all the ways that you can do learning on your own by watching stuff like that. Moving on to George's favorite, William Tecumseh Sherman. Probably actually not George's favorite because he burned half of it to the ground. He's a Union general. He uses the scorched earth total war strategy in the South. We talked about him yesterday from the Battle of Atlanta, where he sieged Atlanta. And then after capturing Atlanta, he marches from Atlanta to Savannah, north to southeast. Uh, and he, it's called the March to the Sea because he goes all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And he burns everything along the way. So like I said, he's probably not Georgia's favorite because he damaged a lot of Georgia along the way. Now, 150 years later, maybe a lot of people don't think about it or they've gotten over it. But there are still some people in Georgia who uh, would not appreciate hearing the name William Tecumseh Sherman, and they hold stuff against him, right? They blame him for burning Georgia to the ground. So kind of interesting there. And he, uh, you know, he's, he's walked where we are. He's walked in our state, so it's kind of a connection to history that we have there. Hey, Devin, where do you think he went to school? West Point. He went to West Point, West Point class of 1840, and he was ranked sixth in his class. So that's pretty good. Pretty high rate, yeah, smart guy, pretty smart guy there. I was, yeah, since you asked, I was 555 out of 1,310, 1,310. So not bad, not bad, like right smack in the middle, basically. I mean, like right smack in the middle. And uh, uh, his class was a lot smaller. His class probably had about 150 people. When did he graduate? 1840. You guys ready for that? West Point graduate, class of 1840. And here's something interesting. A lot of these guys were in the military, and then they left the military. And then when the, the war broke back out, they kind of rejoined. Well, in his middle years... He was the superintendent of Louisiana State University, SEC, SEC. Now, it actually wasn't called LSU. It was called Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy, but it is the future LSU. So he was, he was the superintendent or president of LSU, Louisiana State University. Uh, here is, uh, here is, here is uh, uh, Sherman just on his horse overlooking Atlanta. That guy, that guy's seen some Grants. stuff, man. Like, look at the creases in his I'm eyes. That guy's seen some stuff. And then just another picture here. I bet he drinks a lot of beer. He's, like, I just, I just been no, he's really, really copying that other dude. I'm sh I showed you this yesterday. This has a little bit more information. Here's the path of his march to the sea. It took 37 days. So think about Gettysburg. Three days long of killing. This was 37 days. They're 50 miles wide. 285 miles long, 62,000 people walked this path, burning things to the ground. I pointed out to you yesterday, this is Alma, this is Waycross. So we're a little bit to the south of where it happened, but it's still definitely a part of our state's history. This is what they were doing when they were burning things along their whole stretch. Yeah, they, were they were tearing up railroad ties, that's right. And here's what they'd actually do. They would light the wood on fire. Right, right, light the, the railroad tie on fire. The wood being on fire would make the metal do what? Overheat. Overheat. <laughs> when it, and heated up metal, what can it do? It can bend. It can bend. So here's what they did they took the railroad ties and they bent them around trees. Because once it bends, it's not usable anymore, right? They didn't want the South to still get, uh, get the steel and try to use the steal. So this is called Sherman's neckties. Why they just take like it? your time. It's heavy, man. You can't just carry that stuff with you. So these are called Sherman's neckties. This is actually a real Sherman's necktie. It is still in, you know, in place like a memorial. Man, this is at Stone Mountain, Sherman's necktie. That's cool. um, so it's pretty interesting that this happened all across Georgia. Question. I'm going to have like any Sherman stuff with this. Uh, so, I mean, Alma does not have a Civil War battlefield or anything like that. We're, we're a little bit oh, to the south of where all that happened. Uh, this is a quote. I'm trying, not to say, I'm, trying, I'm trying to go fast, guys. This is a quote. Sherman says, I'm sick and tired of war. War is hell. 
it takes someone who's been to war to know that war is hell. So don't think that these guys liked war. They did not like killing. They did not like the dying that was happening. They, they knew that war is hell. Uh, that's a big question. I don't have the answer to. What about you? Do you think there's going to be a war? Yes. Let's finish out. Robert E. Lee, Confederate general. He led the Army of Northern Virginia, but really he led all the Confederate armies. Originally, he did not want to secede, right? He was a member of the United States Army. In fact, Abraham Lincoln, when the war broke out, he called Robert E. Lee and said, Hey, Robbie, will you lead my army? The Union Army. Robert E. Lee was waiting to see what Virginia would do. If Virginia seceded, he was going to secede. If Virginia had stayed with the Union, he was going to stay in the Union. Well, when Virginia seceded, even though he was opposed to secession, he followed. He joined Virginia. And because of that, he joins the Confederate Army. Uh, we talked a lot about how the South had the talented military commanders, maybe the more talented military commanders. He is definitely one of them. He's kind of like the number one of them. And uh, even though he had fewer soldiers, fewer resources, all that kind of stuff, he still beat the Union a lot of times uh, with fewer soldiers, fewer guns, all that kind of stuff. So his military genius is what allowed him to do that. Hey, Devin, I got a question for you. West Point. Where do you think Robert E. Lee went to school? West Point. West Point, class of 1829. And then actually he goes back and becomes the superintendent of West Point as well. So he was a West Point guy, right? He was He's actually West Point a legend. You know, he's a West Point legend. And it's really sad that he broke away from the Union. Okay, It's kind of a negative part of his legacy that he uh, broke away from the Union and fought against his old friends and all that kind of stuff. Like when he was a superintendent, he taught people who would then later be on the other side of the war. So it's a very sad time, brother against brother, father against son. And uh, sometimes West Point classmates were split up or teacher and cadet. They got split up, all that kind of stuff. Devin, what's your question? Why do all these people go to West Point? Because at the time, it was the premier institution for learning things about the military. And it still is, right? If you read military history, yeah, I know, I know. a lot of our Army officers come out of West Point. Robert E. Lee also has a quote that is against war. It is well that war is so terrible or we should grow too fond of it. He's saying if war is fun, we might go to war all the time. But war is terrible, so we should not go to war, right? People who've been to war hate war. I'm one of them. How, how did his life end up? This is a really important thing to think about because after the war was over, you know what he did? He swore his allegiance back to the Union. And his, his example was followed by many, many, many other Confederates, right? Some people thought maybe we can keep fighting. Maybe we can have a guerrilla war. Maybe we can shoot him from behind the tree lines. But when Robert E. Lee swore his allegiance back to the Union, a lot of people followed him. He goes on to become president of what is known as Washington College. And he had, this is the gentleman, Robert E. Lee. Not the general, but now he's just Mr. Robert E. Lee, right? He spends the rest of his life trying to bring reconciliation from north to south, trying to heal the wounds of the war. He only lives for five more years. He dies in 1870, but he spends those five years as president of this college. And today, old age, today it is called Washington and Lee University. Is, yeah, so it's named after George Washington and Robert E. Lee. This is their legacy. He's actually buried at the university. This is his tomb right here. This is marble. Okay, this is not his body. This is marble. But he's buried right here, and it is at the university. So a lot of people, kind of a mixed feeling here, because what are these? Confederate flags, right? He was a Confederate guy. Now, interesting enough, he didn't own any slaves. His wife's family owned slaves, so his father-in-law gave him slaves as an inheritance. But he himself, Devin makes a great point. He says they don't have problems with that. A lot of people do have problems with that. It's a very difficult situation because they're honoring the man, but the cause was about slavery and racism, and it's very complicated. Very complicated. In fact... Robert E. Lee has many statues throughout the country. However, many of them have been removed recently. Take yourself back to the summer of 2020. This is in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of Virginia. And this is a, a, a General Lee statue being removed from Richmond, Virginia. Wow. Talon, what's your question? Um, I don't know. 
the Confederate flag was um Valentine Force <laughs> Exactly. That's why that's why that's why people have an issue with it, because it represents slavery, it represents the Confederacy, it represents the racism and such like yeah. that. So, like it's not like a battle flag like for slavery, it's like the but yeah, so we, we kind of talked about it the other day when you're gone. I believe in teaching the history of it, but the sentiment that comes from it, I think it's a, it's appropriate that we've removed it from places like NASCAR or state capitals and such like that. So history, but also some history is bad, and we don't need to celebrate the cause that came from it. Robert E. Lee's statue, slave, you said why? Because of what it represents. Some people recognize that it represents slavery, and that's why the statues have been removed. I don't want to get too deep into the politics. I mean, I'm just teaching you the facts. Uh, look at the bottom of the horse's stomach, right? <laughs> I mean, it's for the past, though. Like, leave everything in the past. It's, it's a big topic. There's a lot to think about. There are two sides, and we're teaching both sides. It's like, what's your question? What do they do when they take them down? They break them or something? Uh, I don't have that answer. They probably take them to the scrapyard. This is our last one. Help me finish. Help me finish before the bell rings. Mark one, right here. Uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. He gets his fame and he gets his nickname at the Battle of Bull Run. It is said that he was standing like a stone wall, which is why he's named Stonewall Jackson. He uh, he is a very talented military commander. He's one of the examples of the South having talented military commanders. But unfortunately, he dies about halfway through the war. He actually dies before Gettysburg. A lot of people think if he had been at Gettysburg, he might have helped Robert E. Lee win that battle. But he was dead. He was not at Gettysburg because he, he, because he was dead. How did he die? He got shot by his own army. Now, not on purpose. It wasn't murder. But, yeah, it was at nighttime, and there were some guards. They're on guard, and they hear people off in the distance, and they shoot at the people that they hear. Well, guess who they shot? They shot their own general. I know they feel bad. Yeah, right? But they felt bad real bad. He got shot in the left arm. It actually, he didn't get killed by the shot. His arm got amputated, and then there was infection, and he got pneumonia. He died from pneumonia. So he got shot. He got pneumonia. He died about 30 days later. And, uh, and unfortunately, obviously, that means he's out of the war because he died. Hey, Devin, where do you think he went to school? That's correct. West Point class of 1846. I know I'm going fast. If you need me to go back to something, I will. West Point class of 1846. Uh, so, you know, just that, that makes all four of our generals as West Point graduates. I told you he got his nickname because at the Battle of Bull Run, his unit was standing like a stone wall. And another general observed him and said, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. So that's why we call him Stonewall Jackson. Picture of him, actual picture of him. Jackson also has statues removed from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and that's just a part of the history as well. I got one more West Point fact for you. Are you ready for it? Also a member of the so-called Long Gray Line is Washington. your teacher, of course, Mr. Swanson himself, class of 2010. And I have nothing else notable to go with my name. I'm just a graduate of West Point, class of 2010. That is me. That is me in 2010. What? 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 Did I get plump or something? Did I go to Grant? see that. So, oh, um, right. so, so, hang on. You was ugly back then. Hang on. No, I was way better looking back then. I don't know what happened. At West Point, a lot of times, one of the mottos is, much of the history we teach is made by the people we taught. And you can see that. Much of these Civil War generals in the history that we teach was made by these guys who went to West Point and were a part of the Army. So, let me finish up. Let me see your notes here. So, I apologize. I have no time left for you in class, but this is what I need you to do. This is homework. What I want you to do is take any of these people that we talked about. On Google Classroom, I made a post. I posted links. Click one of those links. Read through that article. Just tell me who you choose here. Okay, make sure I know what the name is. And it says, sketch a picture of that person. Some of you are artistic. That should be fun. I want you to come up with eight facts. Right. It, could be, it could be the big facts. It could be the small facts. I just want you to do some reading on your own. Okay? Have fun. Enjoy the assignment. Come up with eight facts about this person. This will be due when we come back on Wednesday. All right. We got five stinking days to do it. We'll be due when we come back on Wednesday. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Some people say Tuesday, some people say Wednesday. We're coming back Wednesday. Back on Wednesday. Wednesday.
Yes. Yes, please do. Please do.